Good morning to everyone here assembled. As a grain of mustard seed, a uh, verse found in Luke 17, 6, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be plucked up by the roots and thrown into the sea, and it would do so. Well, I'll be perfectly frank, I don't understand that kind of faith. I've spent my whole life trying to investigate faith, find out exactly what it is, and I suppose in that sense my sermon today is going to be a bit of a testimonial about that. <clears throat> but we're going to take a look at other aspects of faith today, but before we do that, let's just uh, bow our heads for a moment. Almighty God of creation, Lord of the universe, we do thank you for your great love. We thank you, Father, for your existence and for this thing called faith. It's uh, all part of what will uh, constitute the relationship we have with you through eternity. I just pray, Father, that your spirit will be here amongst us this morning, uh, upon the ears of the listeners, that it may go home with them, and upon the, uh, the tongue of the speaker. Uh, that he may deliver that message with efficiency. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible is, is huge. It contains 66 books. And some of those books themselves are huge, like Isaiah with 66 chapters, coincidentally enough. Psalms with 150 chapters. And some people are so well-versed in Scripture that it seems to us as if they know everything there is to know from this book. However, they, uh, these are the very same people who will tell you that they have barely scratched the surface of what is contained within it. I find it amazing that the content, the content of the Bible is so vast that one could spend literally a lifetime and still not ingest it all. Sean Boonstra has discovered layers of meaning in scriptures that I've been reading all my life and never suspected the existence of the meanings that he has described. Walter Veith has an enviable grasp on scripture coupled with the sharp mind of a university professor. And Doug Batchelor would appear to have the equally enviable ability of always knowing where to go in scripture when answering almost any question on his show Bible Answers Live. While at Canadian Union College, now called Berman University, I recall sitting in casual conversation with young, new Adventist Christians who were on fire for Jesus. Some had converted to Adventism straight out of the streets of the world where Bible was a dirty word. They spoke very intelligently on biblical topics and frankly, I was jealous of their ability to learn so much so quickly and support what they were saying from Scripture. They not only recited the verse from memory, but indicated the text in which it could be found in the Bible. Not wanting to be left out of such a stimulating conversation and not wanting to be thought of as uh, inadequately prepared, I added my two cents worth, but when it came to supporting my comments from Scripture, I was embarrassed to admit that I couldn't remember where in the Bible I had read it, but I, I knew it was there somewhere and said so. To add to my embarrassment, someone else finished off the text for me. Then they told me where my particular Scripture could be found, followed with a, a wee reminder to read 2 Timothy 2.15, where it says to study, to show thyself approved. They were merciless, but young people your own age tend to be that way with their peers. How many times have you said, well, I can't remember where I read it, but I know it's in the scripture there somewhere. I know it's in the Bible. I heard this. I read this in the Bible. I actually heard a pastor say that from the pulpit one time. For me, I was always embarrassed at not knowing the location of a scripture that might make a big difference in what someone else chose to believe. You see, just being able to rhyme off a few verses or two doesn't mean that much if people can't look it up for themselves and see if it really says what you claim it says. Now, there was a lot of pressure on campus back in those days for students to take a year or two off of school and go to some foreign mission field. I liked the idea very much, but declined the opportunity 
knowing that my level of biblical knowledge was insufficient for effective witnessing. Now, I kind of beat myself up uh, pretty badly over this back uh, at that time, but I didn't stop to take into account that I was a new Christian, and uh, I had not put in the time yet necessary to accumulate the, uh, the scriptural basis that uh, would be necessary for that kind of service. After returning home from college, I began committing scripture to memory. I remember a fellow by the name of Elder Spear uh, doing a program in Hamilton, uh, 1975, 76, something like that. And uh, he had entire chapters of the Bible committed to memory. And one of the things he used to do uh, during his uh, programs was get up front and begin his uh, sermon or his, his talk by reciting an entire chapter from Scripture. And everybody flocked to those meetings because they wanted to hear him do that. They wanted to see him do that. And somehow I equated that with holiness and thought, boy, I'd sure like to be that. <clears throat> uh, I had a vast collection of verses locked away in my mental vault. I think it was Second Thessalonians 4 I had committed to memory. But the opportunity to use those verses never came up. I was living out in the world again. And so with the passing of the years, many of those key verses slipped back into obscurity and were lost to other concerns. You know the saying, life is what happens when you make another plan. Everybody knows that a tool is no good to anybody unless it gets used. Anyone who does construction or has a workshop knows that tools must be maintained, cleaned, sharpened, filed, oiled, whatever. When allowed to become rusty, a tool is useless or even dangerous. So sometime later, I launched into a campaign to restore my previous knowledge of Scripture, an action that would invariably boomerang on me, and we'll demonstrate later in the sermon how that came to be. I'm going to revert back now a little bit uh, uh, earlier in my past and talk about when I was 10 years old. My grade five teacher began teaching us about Australia. I found it only mildly interesting until he got to the part about the Maori, the Bushmen, and how they hunted with boomerangs. There were all sizes of boomerangs, little ones for birds and lizards, bigger ones for koala bears, and really big ones over three feet across for knocking down kangaroos. I always wanted to see how big the one was for taking out alligators, but they apparently didn't have one of those. I found it amazing, to, to begin with, I found it amazing that these bushmen could throw a stick of wood accurately enough to knock out some animal. I tried throwing sticks of wood at targets, but the only thing I ever knocked out was the neighbor's kitchen window. The most amazing thing about boomerangs, however, was that if you missed your target, the boomerang would sail on past and begin a slow circular climb, arcing around a full 360 degrees and come back and land virtually at your feet. I'm still amazed by that. You didn't have to go several hundred yards into the scrub or the forest looking for it in order to retrieve it. It came back to you. Aren't you glad bullets don't do that? For a 10-year-old kid, this was magic. Who ever heard of a stick that comes back to you when you throw it? Closest thing I had to that was a dog that would go and get the stick and bring it back. We had pictures of boomerangs in the geography textbook, and that was all I needed to get started on making my own boomerang. Knowing nothing about aerodynamics, I grabbed a piece of plywood from my father's shed and got started. And after about 20 minutes and a bit of sanding, I was ready to test my first boomerang. I went to the ball field at the local public school and stood there full of expectation. I drew my arm back and I flung that thing as hard as I could out into the field. But after about only 30 feet of flight, it began to flip and flop totally out of control and hit the ground so hard it, it broke in half. Trying not to show too much disappointment, I decided there was some design flaw, or possibly the plywood too, was too flexible. Yeah, that was it, I decided, and retired back into the woodshed, emerging 40 minutes later 
with uh, the new improved hardwood boomer rocket. Yes, sir, things would be different with this one. I launched that boomerang with extra zeal just to watch it flip and lurch sideways and come to grief against a, truck, a trunk of the large spruce tree in our front yard. Boy, I guess the Titanic wasn't the only thing that ever sank on its maiden voyage. This was too much defeat, so I abandoned the whole boomerang thing until later that summer. It was garbage day, and all the neighbors had put out their garbage at the end of the driveways. On top of one pile of garbage, I noticed a V-shaped object that looked like a boomerang. I walked up to it and looked at it. Yeah, that's a boomerang. I guess someone was cleaning out their basement and was getting rid of old souvenirs. So I looked around to make sure no one was watching and then I garbage picked. And uh, wondering if I'd have better luck with this one. I got home just in time to meet up with a friend who I invited to come with me over to the schoolyard and check this thing out. Once there, I wasted no time and I flung it for all I was worth. But just like before, it flipped and flopped and fell to the ground like all the others. My friend called out to me, you're throwing it wrong. Huh? I said, turn it over. What do you mean? Throw it with the V pointing forward. How would you know, I said. I saw it on a TV show, just do it, he said. So I turned it over and flung it with the V pointing forward and wonder of wonders that thing sliced through the sky like a hot knife through butter. And then the real magic began to happen. I watched as it slowly began to rise and go into that wide circle. This was spectacular. I never thought I would ever see such a thing in real life. It was coming back. This boomerang about two feet across continued on its journey as I stood there transfixed by the beauty of its flight pattern. Oh, the wonder of it all. I savored the thrill of success as this small dream come true made a 10-year-old boy very happy. So it really is true, I said. They do turn around and come back to you. I stood there totally mesmerized. About this time, a small nagging voice in my mind began trying to tell me something. I ignored it and continued admiring my boomerang as it uh, swept through the sky. The nagging voice got louder as I began to feel a peculiar sense of uneasiness. What was that voice trying to tell me? Suddenly, I noticed how close the boomerang was and the distance between me and it was closing up rapidly. Now I heard that voice very clearly and it was saying, run. I dodged to one side, but should have stayed where I was. My memories are a bit hazy beyond that point. But all I can say for sure is that after you've thrown a boomerang, move well away from where you were when you threw it. Okay, so what do boomerangs do? They come back to you. And they're a fit example of everything you do in life. There really is no such thing as a non-boomerang event. Everything you do has consequences. Now, because when you do something good and you have good consequences, we don't call that a boomerang. We call that the results, the dividends, the blessings. But when something uh, results in an unpleasant experience, we refer to that as a boomerang experience. Because oftentimes, if you ever get hit with a real boomerang, it hurts, first of all. And events in life that uh, don't go the way you'd like them to, they hurt. So it's an appropriate analogy. So how did learning scripture by heart and knowing their locations in the Bible boomerang on me? All I wanted to do was impress people. Well, at 20 years of age, my desire to know scripture was fueled by a feeling of inadequacy whenever I was in the presence of others who knew their Bibles well. It wasn't because I had a burning desire to know scripture. I just didn't want to look stupid when I was among them and that was as far as it went. I had great respect for the Bible scholars in our church and believed that their advanced knowledge of Scripture was a clear indicator of their holiness. I genuinely believed that these people were saved, and who knows, maybe even a part of the 144,000. And I didn't want them to think that I wasn't. 
Among the members of my family, my devotion to Bible study was well noted. But as you might recall from my sermon last week, my family was not all that friendly toward committed Christianity. My mother thought it was great, and it did bring my grandparents into the church. But the extended family spread the word that Brian had gone over the edge, round the bend, over the top. He was a nut. Overnight, I had gotten a reputation of a holy Joe, a preacher, a self-made saint. The really peculiar thing is that all my cousins, aunts, and uncles expected and demanded perfection from me. I didn't realize that the public expectation of perfection is that you must never do anything wrong. But they can do whatever they want. That's the rest of the family members. I don't know where non-Christians got the idea that all Christians regard themselves as holy and perfect. But non-Christians are dead set on showing Christians that they are not holy and perfect. My family didn't realize, and when I say my family, I mean all my uncles and aunts. They didn't realize that a Christian is someone who recognizes how fault-ridden they are, not how perfect. Despite all of this, however, despite my readily apparent uh, faults, at every anniversary party or wedding feast or family funeral, I was always the one they asked to do the blessing or offer a public prayer. Now, I was extremely bashful about doing those sorts of things. I had no confidence in myself in getting up before people and offering a prayer. All I wanted to do was just know my scripture. I uh, don't know how they figured I'd be any good at that because I wasn't. But no matter how poor a prayer I said, they continued to ask me probably because nobody else wanted to. All I had wanted to do was be able to quote a few verses so my religious friends would hold me in the same regard as I held them. It appeared as if the whole thing had boomeranged, and I was now in a worse state than before. The attendant anxiety of all this was a key factor in my decision to head off to Bible college again. I was cutting and running. After sufficient time at Walla Walla College, however, it became clear to me that my original motives were not right before God. You have to want to know scripture out of a love for truth, not so you look acceptable to your colleagues. I didn't realize it then, but these first few faltering steps would set the stage for a deeper, more meaningful faith that would come later. Okay. I'm going to try to catch up on the slides here because I've, there's our boomerang. Slide number five, okay. So this faith that I was developing came as a realization of why we do things, why we not only learn Bible scripture, but why we keep the commandments of God. Do we keep the commandments of God just so we won't be lost? How can that be worth anything? Are we changed? Are we a person that is fit company for angels and perfect beings? We spoke of faith back then as if we knew what it was but I really do believe that it now takes a lifetime to truly discover what genuine faith is all about. So today I'm only going to tell you what I've discovered about faith up to this point in my lifetime. Okay, that's not the slide that I want. All right. Actually, it is the slide I want. In Luke 18, 8, Jesus says, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Now, this text always intrigued me. When Jesus said, When the Son of Man cometh, we know he's talking about the second coming because he had already arrived here on earth when he said this and had been here for 30-some years. He then said, Shall he find faith on the earth? Not, Did he find faith? The word shall denotes a future tense such as shall we go on a picnic or what shall we do tomorrow? The word shall basically means the same thing as will. 
and denotes something that is going to occur in the future. So Jesus here is talking of a future coming, and we all know that at his future coming, Jesus will remove the righteous living from the earth to take them home to heaven, where they will spend eternity with him. And here is where the confusion can enter the picture, because we know the living righteous will be saved by their faith. The just shall live by their faith. Remember the text? So the answer is, yes, he will find faith on the earth when he comes. Of course he'll find faith. If he doesn't, then there would be no one saved, and no point in coming. But will it be faith to the degree that he wants us to have? Or will it affect the changes to our character that he wants it to? Faith is a word that we as Christians throw around a lot. We like to say that salvation is by faith and not works, lest any man should boast. And that is accurate. That is true. We like to believe that we know exactly what Jesus is talking about when he uses the word faith. We know some of the elements of faith. And probably the first one that comes to our mind is implicit trust. If someone truly loves us, we have faith that they will do no, uh, nothing to grieve or sadden us. And we likewise will, will not do anything to alarm or distress those that we love. Indeed, one other definition of faith is love. A very simple definition. We use it all the time. If a man has been married to a woman for decades and never once messed around with another woman, we say that he has been what? Faithful. He's been faithful to her. Ladies and gentlemen, faith is love. Good old-fashioned, simple love. And that shouldn't be so hard to understand or to put into practice. After all, Jesus came and gave us a perfect example of how to love. So when Jesus says, have faith in me, he's saying, love me. That's all he's saying, just love me. Or when we read about God's faithful followers, we call them faithful because they do what? What do God's faithful followers do? And the, the, they show that trust by doing what? If you love me, keep my commandments. Right. We got a verse here. Should say that. Okay. The righteous are faithful because they keep his commandments because they love them. Okay. I'm going to say that again. It's kind of a sequence. The righteous are called faithful because they keep his commandments because they love them. They don't keep his commandments because they're afraid. So there it is again. Faith is love, but without the love, you're just going through the motions, spinning your wheels. There is, therefore, no love and therefore no faith. If you keep the commandments because you're afraid you'll be lost, that's not faith. That's fear. I want to show you a text here. Okay. Uh, I had Revelation 21 here. I don't know where it went. I'll try that again. No, I'm, I don't know where it went. Okay. Uh, I'll just uh, paraphrase it for you. I don't have my Bible with me. And it talks about, well, actually, uh, can I get a Bible? Can someone lend me a Bible? These verses were supposed to be on the uh, slideshow, so I didn't bring a Bible. That'll teach me, eh? We're looking for uh, Revelation 21, verse 8. And this is crucial because uh, this is one of those verses that it's easy to miss. Thank you, James. Okay. So here we see the, uh, the righteous in the holy city. And uh, it's talking about how outside are, are dogs and whoremongers. And it says here, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, uh, all will have their part in the lake of fire. Now, in the King James Version, it says, the fearful. The fearful will have their part in the lake of fire. Those who pursue their salvation out of fear. Perfect love casteth out fear. If your fear has not been cast out, then you don't know God. You haven't taken the time to get to know him, and therefore, unfortunately, you don't have the credentials to be in the holy city. Therefore, 
Faith is love. I rest my case. The concept of uh, uh, implicit trust we mentioned earlier. Faith, just like love, has many different aspects to it. We might claim that we have faith in God but crumble when tested because we don't have any experiencing in total genuine trust of anything. I think of the example of Peter. Now, can we say Peter loved Jesus? Sure he did. But when his faith was uh, tried, what happened? He was fearful, and he crumbled three times, not just once. But he still loved him. So obviously there's something else about faith that uh, we need to define yet. Sometimes faith and trust are just lip service. Easy to say, not so easy to do. Now, the story is told of an old, uh, sorry, the story is told of a tightrope walker somewhere around the turn of the last century. I could be wrong, but I think it was Blondin. I don't expect everyone here to know who Blondin was, but that's what he did. He was famous for walking uh, tightropes. You may have heard of him. He arrived at a huge cheering crowd at Niagara Falls one day. They had strung a steel cable across the Niagara Gorge, and he said to the crowd, how many of you here believe I can walk across this gorge on this one thin wire you see before you? The crowd cheered and declared their confidence in him. A wheelbarrow was parked in front of him, and pointing to it, he said, how many of you believe I can push this wheelbarrow across this gorge on this one thin wire? Again, the crowd erupted in loud confirmation of their total confidence in his ability to do this. Then he said to the crowd, Who among you is willing to be my passenger in the wheelbarrow while I do this? This time the crowd stood silent, not a single voice, no loud cheering or confirmation of their belief in him. So long as there was no risk to them, they had all the faith in the world that he would deliver as promised and put his life on the line to entertain them. But when it appeared that they might have to put their lives on the line, literally, they quickly lost their faith. Trusting fully to God to preserve you when your life is at stake is a degree of faith that only comes from observing firsthand the power of God through answered prayer. When God has rescued you from dilemma after dilemma so that you have full confidence that he is there. Now, there's an image here I want to show you. Am I going backwards? Excuse me just a moment, please. Uh, EAV booth, are we having problems with the slides? Okay, I'm just going to continue. Say again. I need slide number 13, uh, 12, slide number 12. This is a special slide. I like this slide. It, it kind of gets the message across uh, with regards to what I'm saying right now. No luck? Is that 12? Oh, the count's messed up then somehow. No, okay, I'm going to just have to abandon it. I don't know why this always happens. So I'm just going to talk then, okay? Uh, When God has rescued you from dilemma after dilemma. Oh, by the way, if you're curious about what that slide was, it was a picture of uh, a rocky prominence, a point of rock sticking out uh, over a drop of about 3,000 feet and a guy hanging on for his his dear uh, life by his fingernails. Okay, so... When God has rescued you from dilemma after dilemma so that you have full confidence that he is there and that always hears you, when he answers your prayers by giving you better than you had asked for, when your back is against the wall and there's no way out, and he creates a way out and delivers you from certain humiliation and defeat time after time, then your faith in him allows you to submit to whatever he chooses to put you through because you know that whatever happens, he's got your back, and will do only that which is best for you. This is a degree of faith 
that we are all required to have and must have to make it through the days ahead with their new world order and the one world agenda. If you find yourself going into those days with fear and apprehension, then start spending more time in co close communion with your God. Get to know him better yet than you ever have so that you can enter into that time of trouble with full confidence that he will see you through to his coming into a wonderful eternity of sinlessness and time spent with him. There is to be no fear in your relationship with God. John 4, 18, perfect love casteth out fear. While men's hearts are failing for fear and the rest of the world are living in dread of what is coming, the perfect peace of God's love, the peace that passeth understanding, Philippians 4, 7, will constitute your faith in him. A part of faith we haven't looked at yet is obedience. Most people don't think of obedience as faith, but it is an absolute requirement. This is perhaps a little more problematic for humans because in order to survive in this world, we have to be somewhat self-directed and are not used to having someone else govern the more private issues of our thoughts and minds. Faith is well defined in the popular hymn, Trust and Obey, which will be our closing hymn for the day. So this is a perfect description of faith. And if you're ever looking for a definition of faith, or <coughs> excuse me, or someone asks you, what is faith? Just refer them to that hymn. We've already looked at trust. No matter how crazy it gets, God is always in control. And remember that nothing ever happens unless God permits it. And he always has a reason for permitting it whether it directly benefits you or the greater body of believers. Taking over the reins of control and attempting to resolve an issue that belongs to God alone, uh, all alone uh, is not faith. Abraham and Sarah did that, and the result was the Muslim Empire who make no bones about hating Christianity. David did that, and his, his kingdom and his household was uh, ever filled with chaos to the day he died. Saul did that, and he and his household were destroyed. Even Moses did that by saying, Shall we bring you water? And was subsequently banned from the promised land. In each case, not only did these people move independent of God, but they broke a law of God in doing so. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments here. Not to mention that uh, they were acting according to their own timing, not God's timing. Have you ever noticed God has a time for everything that he does? In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. So it is our responsibility as faithful followers of God to ask, believing he will do that which is best for us, not necessarily that which we want, then wait patiently. And sometimes it may be years before the answer comes. But when it comes... We will have another testimonial of answered prayer with which to praise him, thank him, and witness to others about the glorious love of God. And each such testimonial is yet another proof of God's existence as well as his incredible love. Among nominal Christians, there is a saying, God helps those who help themselves. Oh, they think it's cute and witty, and it's used to justify a lot of unfaithfulness in the churches of the world. I've even heard it in the Adventist church. But the truth is, God does not help those who help themselves. He helps those who cannot help themselves. The danger of moving out in your own strength is a pernicious sin to be avoided at all costs. And here's where we need the wisdom of God to recognize when a situation is beyond our ability to resolve. We have to recognize when we're in over our heads, and if you are finally brought to the point where you've taken the problem to God, this is good, but for goodness sake, have the presence of mind to stand back and let him solve the problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Before I uh, became a school teacher, I used to be a TV repairman. I remember doing a house call at this fellow's place one day he asked me to put a new picture tube in his TV. He decided that that's what it needed. I had a look inside the TV set, and it was very apparent that he'd been in there adjusting controls and changing the settings and various circuits. Now, I had uh, studied three years in advanced electronics 
at uh, Fanshawe College in London, plus one year of engineering electronic. So it was pretty easy to see that this fellow had been meddling with the electronic, and it was readily apparent it, that set didn't need a new picture tube. In an attempt to resolve, or rather to restore the, uh, the picture, I began to reset all the controls to their proper place. And at this point, he became frantic and demanded to know what I was doing. I thought he'd be happy to know that he wasn't going to have to pay $300 for a new picture tube. I told him I was resetting the kind bias, doing a preliminary color convergence, and readjusting the focus to allow a clear image on the screen. Then he said to me, you leave those alone. I adjusted those myself, and I know they're just fine where they are. I turned to him and said, show me the kind bias control. And where is the blue convergence ring in this set? He stared at me for a while, then said, well, you know what? It's probably better if I just buy a new TV. I tried in vain to convince him that that was not necessary. I could restore his set. But according to him, he knew more about TV than I ever did without ever having gone a single day to school. I had to leave that day, unable to help him in any way. Likewise, you see, God wants to make himself known to us by repairing our lives. But how can we if we don't let him? Because we are not at this time allowed to see, hear, or touch God, he is restricted in how he chooses to communicate with us. It's hard to think of God as being restricted, but he has agreed to a course of action whereby we don't actually get to perceive him with our five senses until his second coming. And so until then, the most effective way God has of showing us his love is by answering our prayers. And if we jump into the picture and defeat his plans, then we have just scuttled an opportunity for him to give us more than we asked for, which in my books is a tragic loss. It's a frustration to God, a frustration to the angels, and ultimately to ourselves as well. So when it is apparent that our only duty is to wait, for heaven's sakes, obey. Do what you're supposed to, and the greater blessing will fall upon you at the proper time, and the greater glory will be conferred upon God. If ye love me, keep my commandments. That's part of obedience. It's a greater part. Now, just before we wrap it up here, let's talk about the ultimate act of faith. Ask any nurse in the hospitals of our land, and you'll learn that there are two types of deathbed scenarios. The first type, the vast majority wish they had uh, had it to live all over again. Most will tell you how short life is, and some will resort to weeping. The range of emotions can vary from resignation to fate, all the way over to desperation, tearful, vain regrets, and outright terror. The second type are peaceful and wait quietly for the end to come, believing confidently that they will be brought to life again at the resurrection, just as Jesus was in the tomb. There's not a second of <clears throat> hesitation or uncertainty. They know whom they have believed in and are persuaded that he is able to restore them to full life with a new body when he returns. Only a lifetime spent in meaningful connection with their God has empowered them to go through this phase of life knowing full well that after their eyes close in death, the very next thing they will see is Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. Nevertheless, do we have such faith? Think about that for a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. All our life, we, uh, we have nurtured the will to survive. It's an instinctive part of our psychological makeup. But now, at the end, when it's all over, at a time when there will be no more tomorrows. And yet, according to the scripture, it isn't all over, and there will be an eternity of tomorrows. We can go peacefully, even joyfully, if only we believe. Now, that's a tall order. Indeed, the ultimate exercise in faith to believe that you are going to live again, even when your life here in the physical realm is just about to expire. In John 11, verse 40, at the resurrection of Lazarus, Mary expressed some doubt to Jesus regarding Lazarus' condition. She said he's been dead four days. He begins to stink. 
He's decomposing, Lord. And Jesus said to Mary, Did not I say to you, if you would believe, then you would see the glory of God? In Luke 17, 6, Jesus says, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say to this sycamore tree, Be plucked up by the roots and planted in the sea. Now, I doubt anyone would actually do that to a sycamore tree, but it goes to show that we feeble, powerless humans can move the right arm of God if we just choose to trust, believe, believe, love, and obey God. And we don't have to make a grand display of our faith. Only a little bit of faith, just as much as a grain of mustard seed.